promises never fail. Your promises never fail. the current challenges faced by the nation and the church, both NECF and Prayer United are mobilizing multilingual nationwide prayer sessions online. Do check out their prayer events at www.necf.org.my. The English session is available to join on 15 September at 8pm and there will be no PPN that evening. This year's MDOP, Malaysia Day of Prayer, is happening on 16 September at 8am to 11pm via Zoom. Please get the links from Resiji leaders and pastors. As the nation celebrates her 58th Malaysia Day, let us continue to unite our hearts as the Church of Malaysia and pray for her recovery and healing. Today is Communion Sunday once again. And uh, as we take time to remember our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ in His death and His resurrection, as we partake of the Holy Communion, I would like to begin uh, by looking uh, to God our Father and uh, to pray that we will steal our hearts as we remember our Lord. Father, we want to commit this Holy Communion Sunday unto you. And today, even as we want to remember our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ in his death and his resurrection, grant us this grace to steal our hearts, to look to you, to rest in that peace that you have given unto us, even as we focus on the work of Calvary and on the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 to 26. Verse 23, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. Verse 24, And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us partake of the bread. Verse 25, In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this, Whenever you drink it in remembrance of me, let us partake of the cup. Verse 26, For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. 
Father, we thank you for the work of Calvary. We thank you for Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, that in his death and his resurrection, he has granted us a new life in you. He has granted us that grace to be called children of God, that forgiveness of our sins is our portion now. We pray, O oh Father, that this morning your grace and your blessing will fall upon each and every one of us, that the glory of God will rest upon our lives. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It is appropriate for all of us to spend some time to reflect on our relationship with God and to know in a much clearer and uh, deeper understanding of His will for our lives. As we go through trying times such as this, it is needful to get our bearings right and not to lose our focus on God. And uh, in that sense, we have to maintain our spiritual zeal and our spiritual fervor. It is good to look afresh into the dynamism of our relationship with God. And for that, I wish to take today's sermon text from the book of Romans, reading from Romans uh, chapter 8, verses 12 to 15. Verse 12 of Romans chapter 8, Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation but it is not to the sinful nature to live according to it. Verse 13, For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Verse 14, the reason is because those who are led by the Spirit of God, are sons of God. Verse 15, For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. These uh, four verses uh, of Romans chapter 8 are set within the context of the 17 uh, verses of uh, Romans 8 from verses 1 to 17. In these verses of Romans chapter 8, the Apostle Paul expounds on the life of holiness through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And if you look at verses 12 and 13, they are verses that encourage believers and exhort us to live by the Spirit and not according to the sinful nature. It is a affirmation that we are called to live a life of holiness through the power of the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul then goes on to verses 14 and 15 where he affirms that we are leading a life of holiness in that pursuit of righteousness through the empowerment of the Spirit of God from the uh, platform, from the ground of being sons of God. And I read verses 14 and 15. It says here in verse 14, because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. And verse 15, For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. In verses 14 and 15, the uh, uh, phrase comes out, verse 14, we are sons of God. And uh, verse 15, 
that we are able to uh, cry to God and address God as our Father in a very personal way through the word Abba. And then there is this uh, emphasis on the, in verse 15 about sonship. The emphasis on these two verses uh, on the father-son relationship is a fundamental aspect of the Christian faith. When the word son is used, when sonship is used, it is a generic uh, reference. Generic means that it refers to not only uh, men, it refers to men and women. So when the verse uh, uh, phrases it as sons of God, it is actually referring to sons and daughters of God. And this emphasis on the father-son relationship between God and us, it is a, an aspect uh, of our Christian faith that grounds uh, almost uh, all aspects of uh, what we do as a Christian. And uh, these two verses brings into focus that the primary objective of the word work of Calvary, uh, that uh, Christ died for us, the primary objective, why did he do so? Uh, that in the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, it is ultimately to foster relational restoration and relational intimacy between believers and God. God loves us and cares for us as a father. Of course, God can be seen in many ways. When we see God as the Lord God Almighty, what comes to mind is His sovereignty and His power and His awesomeness. When we see God described as a king, then we see God in terms of his reign, of the very fact that he has authority over us as citizens of the kingdom of God. When we read about God being a judge, then we see God in terms of the judgment or that he will bring unto men and women for their lives. But today, as we look into God as our Heavenly Father, what comes to mind? Of course, the aspects of power is there, awesomeness is there, the aspects of authority is there, of a judgment and glory. But what primarily comes to our mind is a Father's love. And Psalm 103 verses 13 to 14 mentions the compassion of God for all of us as his children. And uh, it also mentions in Psalm 103 verses 13 to 14 that God always remembers us. And it is uh, looking at uh, this uh, understanding of God as our Father that we realize that God really loves us as a father, loves his children, and God cares for us. And when we look into two verses uh, in the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew 6, 32 to 33, and I read in verse 32 of Matthew chapter 6, Matthew writes, For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. Verse 33, But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Matthew chapter 6, verses 32 and 33 was actually uh, a part of of that sermon in which uh, Jesus actually talks about the uh, way we are to live lives as kingdom people. 
And uh, this portion of it addresses the very fact that God encourages us not to worry about our daily needs, our daily supplies and provisions. That is why in verse 33, Matthew wrote the words of Jesus encouraging us to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and then all these things will be given to us as well. All these things are the things that refer to the daily provisions of life. Food, shelter, clothing, the financial the needs that we have. But uh, one thing uh, comes through very strongly and it is in verse 32 where Jesus mentions the fact that the Heavenly Father, our Heavenly Father knows that we need these things. That this promise of a blessing of financial provision for our daily needs is given in the context of a father-son relationship. That God is our Heavenly Father and He wants to, He desires, He loves to and He cares for us so much that He wants to provide everything for us so that we will not lack any need in this life. So Matthew 6 verses 32 and 33 speaks of the provision of God for all of us in our needs of food, clothing, shelter in the context of Him being our Heavenly Father. In all the blessings that come to us, along with our salvation, this blessing of relational intimacy, that the very fact that we are called children of God, that God is our Heavenly Father, is actually the rightful ground. This blessing is the primary blessing, the rightful ground from which all other blessings are sourced and all other blessings flow. And uh, even when we approach God, our prayers to God should ideally be within the context of a son speaking to a father, that we come to him in relational prayer. We come to God knowing that he desires for us to draw near to Him, knowing that His ears are open to our prayers, that His, his uh, inclination is to favour us and to bless us. So when we come into prayer in that relational approach, we are approaching God as a son. In fact, uh, this uh, particular insight is revealed very clearly in Jesus' uh, teaching uh, and uh, answering uh, the disciples uh, that question when they asked uh, Jesus to teach them how to pray in Matthew 6, 9. The Lord's Prayer begins with, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You will find that it begins by addressing God as our Heavenly Father. So today, my encouragement to all of us is this. As we go through trying times such as this, as the pandemic is still raging on, let us look to God, come to Him, knowing that He is our Heavenly Father. Let us come to Him knowing that primarily God desires for us is to draw closer to Him in relational intimacy. And also knowing that in that relational intimacy will flow the uh, promises of God, will flow the blessings of God which will come unto us and they, these promises of God will be Amen in Christ Jesus. So my exhortation is that all of us this morning will seek God our Father for who He is. That means we come to God without frills, we come to God without expectation, we come to God without all the 
attachments of this life, we come to Him in the love of a son for the Father. That is why Matthew 22 has a summation given by Jesus of all the commandments of the Old Testament. We are to love God with all our heart, all our soul, and all our mind. And uh, that summation is a, a summation that sees that love that we are to have for God as the love of a son for the Father and also as a reciprocation, uh, reciprocation of the Father's love for us. So seek God our Father for who He is and He shall end you shall indeed experience the abundance of the blessings of God as a son. Now, when we begin this relationship with God, right from the time of our conversion, and uh, John chapter 1 verse 12 uh, puts it very clearly, for those who believed in the name of Jesus, they, God gave him the right to be called children of God. So the day when we receive our salvation at the point of conversion, through our saving faith, we all became children of God. And in Romans 8, the Apostle Paul calls it sonship. In that restoration of our relationship with God, in that father-son intimacy, the first and most important promise that God given, gives to us is He will empower us and enable us to live a life of holiness and righteousness. That the immediate blessing, the basic and fundamental the will of God for our lives is to live a life of holiness and righteousness. And so that is why you will find that when sonship is being mentioned in verse 14, and we are called to call God our Father in verse 15, it is set within that exaltation to move us into a life of holiness. Because in verses 12 and 13, we have the Apostle Paul writing, Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation. Now that we are a son to a holy father, we now have an obligation, but that obligation is not to the sinful nature, but to, and not to live according to the sinful nature, but the obligation in verse 13 says that the obligation is to indeed live by the Spirit. Because verse 13 has it, but if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. The misdeeds of the body refer to unrighteous living. The misdeeds of the body refer to what comes out from the sinful nature. Those acts that are unholy, unrighteous, those sinful things that we do, and all those, we are to put them to death by the power of the Spirit. So you will find when you put verses 12, 13, 14, and 15 together, you will find that in verses 12 and 13, there is an exaltation for us in the empowerment of the Holy Spirit to move into a life of holiness and righteousness. And then by verse 14, it says it is because we are sons of God. And as we are sons of God, we will be indeed led by the Spirit of God, which is a spirit of holiness. And then in verse 15, it comes to the point when we look to God and call Him, Abba, my Father. Therefore, as we look into what we have learned so far this morning, 
I would want to recap that first we must understand that as believers we must see God beyond just being the Almighty, being the King and being the Judge. We need fully at, at down deep in our spirit we must see Him as our Father because He indeed has given to us the right of sonship. And the immediate uh, uh, promise to us when we are now children of God is the promise that we are now empowered to live a life of holiness and righteousness in the Spirit. The Apostle uh, Peter uh, reinforces uh, these uh, two insights. The insight of a father-son relationship with the insight of the pursuit of holiness. In the First Peter chapter 1, there are three verses, verses 14 to 16, where he gives us these two insights. In verse 14 of First Peter 1, the Apostle Peter writes, As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. In, and verse 15, But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. And then verse 16, For it is written, Be holy because I am holy. Why did I pick uh, these three verses from uh, 1 Peter chapter 1? Eh? It's because uh, I would like to, uh, to affirm uh, that uh, the first epistle uh, uh, written by Peter to the churches uh, in the Asia Minor, they were not written to them during a time of blessing. They were not written to them when uh, everything was well. In fact, uh, First Peter was a letter written in the 1860s. It was a difficult time for Christians. It was a time of persecution. It was a time of suffering. So if you read First Peter uh, chapter 1, you will realize that uh, the Apostle Peter makes mention of trials in which believers will go through. It was a difficult time. And it speaks to us that as we go through this time of a uh, pandemic, uh, these difficult circumstances, we may be able to identify with the context of the circumstances in which the church was going through during the time when First Peter was being written. A time of suffering, a time of difficulty, and uh, it, is, uh, it is actually uh, insightful to know that during that uh, environment in which the church was in, what Peter did was to exhort them into looking to God, back to their relationship with God, and to look into the primary will of God for their lives, and that is to pursue holiness and righteousness. You can see in verse 14 when the uh, Peter wrote, as obedient children, he was identifying uh, and uh, placing the believers, moving them to look to God as a father. In fact, in verse 17, he mentions God as a father. So, when he goes on to say that the believers are not to conform to the evil desires they had before their old self, but in verse 15, they are to be holy in all they do. And then verse 16, Peter reinforces it with, Be holy because I am holy. Peter was talking about character and conduct. Peter was trying to tell them, even when you go through trying times like this, even when you go through persecution, even when you go through difficult circumstances, you must not waver. You must not lose your focus. You must get your bearings right. 
that the will of God for you through good and through bad times is primarily for you to walk in holiness, for you to be empowered to grow in righteousness, for you to become a better person in God, for you, in fact, to grow in your character and your conduct. That your character must be a character that is a character that will exhibit love, joy and peace. That your conduct must be a conduct that is blameless. It will be reflective of the Father to whom you are related. That is why verse 16, Peter writes, Be holy because I am holy. This is the desire of God for us. The reason why we are to pursue holiness, the reason why we are to be holy, it is because we are the sons and daughters of a God who is holy. That our Father is holy. So we want to be holy in order to bring glory to His name. Therefore, both are the apostles, the apostle Paul, the apostle Peter, they ground the pursuit of holiness on the father-son relationship. And I pray that even as we go through trying times like this, through this raging pandemic, let us not lose focus, that I pray that all of you will continue on your path of holiness and righteousness. And I want to throw in the one blessing that will come from all of this. That in the a focus on the father-son relational intimacy, we pursue holiness because the spirit of holiness, the Holy Spirit will empower us and give us that desire for holiness. We will indeed be able to experience the real power of prayer. It's because we will move into that approach of relational prayer, approaching God in relational intimacy. And when we approach God in relational prayer, a relational prayer grounded in holiness and in that environment of holiness and righteousness, we shall greatly see the manifest power of God in answering our prayers, in our blessings being actualized in the promises of God becoming Amen in Christ Jesus. And we shall indeed be able to say, our God is good. Now, when we move our emphasis between us as individuals, as sons and daughters, personally in relationship to God, to the church. We will find that in relation to the church, our sonship in God brings all of us into the same family. We are the family of God. The use of the word brothers is uh, to address believers in the New Testament uh, is a very frequent use. You will see brothers, uh, brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, they are uh, much used in the epistles of the New Testament. And it is an indication to all of us that the early believers viewed the church really as a family. And one example I can give is 1 Timothy uh, chapter 5, verses 1 to 2, where the Apostle Paul wrote uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, Do not rebuke an older man harshly, but exhort him as if he were your father. It's a family address. Treat younger men as brothers. This is to believers in the church. Older women as mothers and younger women as sisters with absolute purity. Father, mother, 
brother, sister, these are all uh, family addresses. And uh, it uh, tells us very clearly that the church, in a very real sense, is a family. Because uh, I need to emphasize this, that when God gives us the right to sonship, it was a genuine, real confirmation of sonship upon us that God indeed has become really and truly our Heavenly Father and we are really and truly sons and daughters of God. And in that bonding, we all genuinely, as a church, is a family of God. Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 6, verse 10, writes it this way, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people. He says good deeds should be done to all people, but he also affirms, especially to those who belong to the family of believers, that charity begins at home from our own family to the church family and then beyond. Therefore, with this understanding, we must understand that uh, even as we are called to minister to each other and to put our hands on the plow for the work of the ministry, we should do it in the context of a family. We cannot see the church in terms of productivity and efficiency. We should see the church in terms of relationality, in terms of family. We should understand that we have a responsibility to care for one another because we are brothers and sisters in Christ. And we must also understand that when we put our hands on the plow and we do ministry, we serve the Lord, we are doing it as family members. We need to do it in joy. We need to do it together in the bonding of love. And as we relate with one another, uh, we should bear in mind the exhortation of Romans 12 verses 9 to 13. You find that the Apostle Paul, in a writing uh, about uh, justification, about sanctification in the first few chapters uh, of uh, the book of Romans and talking about the uh, destiny of the people of Israel, when he came to Romans 12, he was talking about the practical expression of us being sons and daughters of God. And he wrote it this way in Romans 12, verses 9 to 13. And it is my prayer and uh, my, uh, my heart's desire for tabernacle of praise that we will live as sons and daughters of our Heavenly Father in the church relating as a family, as an authentic people of God, as an authentic uh, family member of the church, the family of God. And uh, it is my desire that we will lift up this uh, exhortations of uh, verses 9 to 13 of Romans chapter 12. And I want to uh, read it carefully and slowly as I impart this unto each and every one of us. This is a direction in which tabernacle of praise will indeed, uh, by the grace of God, grow and move into. Verse 9, love must be sincere. That when we talk about love for one another, there must be a sincerity in that love. That love must follow through with action. That when we say we love one another, we should follow through by actions and behavior that show that we do care for one another. And most of all, Charity does indeed begin from the home. That the way we treat our parents, 
the way as parents we treat our children, the way we treat our spouses, the way we treat our brothers and sisters. The, we must begin from there. The sincerity of the love of God in our hearts is expressed through the way we treat each other as a family at home before it can be reflected in the church family. So I want to encourage all of you, especially during difficult times like this, as many of us need to stay at home, there is much time spent with our family members, we need to show that sincerity of love and care for each and every one of them, whether as a father or a husband, or whether as a brother or a sister, or whether as a son or a daughter, that love must be sincere. And then uh, Paul goes on to say, hate what is evil, cling to what is good that we must understand that our Father is a Holy Father and the Spirit of God given to us is a Spirit of holiness and there must be that desire in us that we want to be a person who will pursue holiness and righteousness that we will hate what is evil and we will cling so strongly to what is good and what is pleasing to God that we will be a church, in verse 10, that says, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. That we will be a church that will be devoted to one another, to honor one another above yourselves. We will be a humble church, a church that will put the interests of others before our own, that will indeed look to God and say everything that we do is all for the glory of God and then especially this is a reminder as we go through difficult times like this in verse 11 never be lacking in zeal but keep your spiritual fervor keep your spiritual zeal your spiritual fervor serving the Lord that even more during a difficult time like this, we need to be spiritually strong. We need to be spiritually zealous. There must be an enthusiasm for the things of God. And then verse 12, we are to be joyful in hope. There is always hope in God, for in Him will we trust. He is our refuge and our fortress. Be patient in affliction. Wait upon the Lord. There is light at the end of the tunnel. There will come a time when indeed the pandemic will be over. Patient in affliction, faithful in prayer, in relational prayer, knowing that we come to God as a son and a daughter coming to a father, and God is zealous for us. And then verse 13, share with God's people who are in need. We want to help people in need to care for them, practice hospitality. If our church can indeed lift up the exhortations of these five verses, verses 9 to 13 of Romans chapter 12, we indeed would reflect the nature of our Holy Heavenly Father, that nature of holiness. And we are on the right road in the pursuit of holiness and righteousness. In conclusion, it is pertinent, it is uh, noteworthy for me to emphasize that there is great significance in being aware and conscious of the fact that God has adopted us in Christ to be his sons and daughters. Seeing God as our Father and relating with him in a father-son perspective enables us to see everything concerning the Christian faith from the vantage point 
of a father's love. We will then realize, we will then realize that at the point of conversion, God really becomes our father. And our primary blessing is relational intimacy with God as our father. And in that relational intimacy, the first and foremost desire of God for us is to pursue holiness, knowing that we are to be holy because God is holy. Let us uh, bow our heads as we look to the Lord. Father, we thank you for this privilege to be able to listen to you through your word that is handed down to us through the generations. And we pray, O oh Father, you will quicken our spirits so that we may become more aware and conscious of the Father-Son relationship that we have with you. That in all things that we do in the name of Christianity, in all aspects of the Christian faith, we will learn to ground it on this Father-Son relationship and to experience that Father's love in our hearts. That even as we come to you in prayer, we will come to you in relational prayer, in that prayer of a son approaching a father who loves and who cares for him. That in the pursuit of holiness, it will be a pursuit through a desire that is given to us as we are led by the spirit of holiness, but a pursuit that is grounded in our father-son status that we are to pursue holiness because our Father is a holy God. And today, I want to pray for that relational intimacy to come upon each and every one of us to be experienced afresh, that we will indeed say we know and really know our God as our, as our Father, we are experiencing afresh His love and we desire to pursue holiness in His name. And I pray that the grace of God will empower you to grow in holiness, to see God afresh in His love and to experience the promises of God which are Amen in Christ Jesus in answered prayer, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, for in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.